It's Paul Marsh here on Express. Delighted to say that I've been joined by the legend that is Dom Jolly. Thank you very much for joining me, sir. Uh, no worries, Paul. How are you? Uh, very good, thank you. Um, now, you are in Portsmouth on the 1st of March with your Conspiracy Tourist Tour. Um, could you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. I've written a book which just came out called The Conspiracy Tourist in which I went round the world hanging out with... Um, well, some of the stranger people in the conspiracy world from flat earthers to trying to prove that Finland exists to uh, Roswell looking at UFOs, basically the whole wacky world of conspiracies. And so the tour is basically taking you through what I've learned, but in a funny way. But also <laughs> because it's a controversial subject, I've invited along one of Britain's leading conspiracists, Dr. Julian Northcote. Now, I haven't actually met him yet. Oh, right. Uh, but this is a man who has written a book called Cows, Britain's Secret Killers, in which he believes that up to 15,000 ramblers a year are killed by cows every year. Uh, and this is all hidden by Big Pharma. So it would be it would be fair to say that we probably don't have the same views on things. Um, <laughs> so I expect it. We're going to have a debate as well. So I, I'm going to expect that to get quite uh, fiery. It's it's really interesting to see where conspiracy uh, theories have come over the last few years because conspiracy theories used to be quite fun and silly, didn't they? And now they've become such a serious business that I see that you you kind of got security there as well. I got security. Yes. If you uh, is that news to you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I'm I could be completely wrong, but I'm led to believe there is going to be security there. Yeah. Oh really? God, that's that's frightening. If I said something in Portsmouth. Um, no, conspiracies definitely did used to be fun and harmless and kind of cranky and a bit weird. And it was kind of, did we land on the moon? Bigfoot, is Elvis still alive and working in a chip shop? And it was kind of fun, you know, like, I think we all like the idea that there's things science don't know and, you know, question stuff. And no one's saying that corporations or governments have not behaved badly. Of course they have. But I just, what I dislike about conspiracy theories in total is the feeling that everyone is bad everyone is at yeah. it everyone yeah. is you know don't trust anyone and i'm i'm afraid we did definitely jump ship like we we sort of jumped a moment there was a moment when kellyanne conway who was donald trump's spokeswoman she used the term alternative facts and i think whatever we believed in the past there was a truth like that we could all kind of we could argue around but we ended up on now there are lots of truths everyone has their own truth and I do think that's really frightening politically. Uh, you know, when you've got the president of the United States telling people to inject bleach and stuff like that, it's it's not good. And then, you know, we've only just started. We've got the advent of AI and deep fakes and stuff. So I'm afraid the concept of what is true uh, is kind of rapidly disappearing. Do you think that in this day and age, we, we are asked to judge very quickly and take sides about what's the truth and what's not, you know, given the information out there? We, we don't have the time to actually, you know, uh, look into things and research things and decide for ourselves whether something is true or not. It's something that we are kind of, you're, I mean, you must get this a lot, you know, asked immediately, do you believe in this or do you not believe in this? Are you left? Yeah. Or right. Where do you stand? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think firstly... You know, the thing that conspiracy theorists always say, you know, I'm a critical thinker, do your own research. Of course, people should do all that. But the point is, there seems to be very much a movement against experts. Now, if we're talking about COVID, I don't have any medical speciality. I have no immunologist speciality. <laughs> so I'm I'm not telling you listen to me on what I think about it. I'm listening to people that I think have spent their life researching it and, and are experts. And to me, YouTube is not a university, and I think a lot of people think it is. But I think the main culprit is is social media, actually, because I think social media polarizes us and it puts us in one team or another. And whatever your team does, you stick with it. And I think most of us are in the middle, kind of thinking, "Well, I, I believe a little bit of that, and yeah. I believe a little bit." It's it's yeah. nuance, but yeah. unfortunately, nuance does not get clicks. And well, I think it's a massive no. it's a massive problem. And I, if you even mention an interest in a conspiracy theory on your socials, the algorithm like kicks in and starts firing stuff at you. I set up a fake Instagram page uh, as a as a conspiracist, and it's unbelievable. Like it's like I'm living in a multiverse, you know, compared to my normal one and, and that one. So I, I don't, I'm not ridiculing conspiracy theorists. I can I really learn how easy it is 
to go down that rabbit hole and how much there's a kind of market to kind of get you to believe that. The people I really have an issue with are the people that know it's rubbish, uh, but use it to make money. That's yeah. what I really hate. Um, I think you you said a lot of really true things there. And the one thing is you're not allowed to be in the middle anymore, are you? You're not allowed no. to kind of make a, an educated statement of saying, well, look, I think this is really good, but I think this is really bad. And I kind of sit somewhere in between. And you either have to be extremely one way or extremely the other way. And that's just not healthy, is it? I don't think it is. And I think that's in our politics as well, because it, the idea now is like you have to be certain. And you know what? If I mistrust anyone... It's someone that's certain because none of us are certain. Oh. I mean, in politics, a bad thing is supposed to be someone that changes his mind. I want someone that changes his mind when the facts change. Yep. Uh, it's it's absolutely crazy. And and you're right. Most of us are in the middle. We're not. We don't know. You know, I want a party that's called We Don't Really Know, <laughs> but we'll look into it, make the best decisions we can. We'll but, think about it. <laughs> the, the radio presenter James O'Brien calls it the footballification of life, which means you've yeah. got your team. And whatever your team does, yeah. you stick with it. And that's crazy, I uh, think. Yeah, but then I don't like football, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, Pompey, you know, you, I wouldn't mention that down here because obviously you're heavily a, a big football town. But no, you are right in, in the fact that opinions, things like that, we should be able to change them when we have new information and things like that have all come to light. So spot on with that one. Um, did you look into anything expecting to debunk it and go, oh, there actually might be something to that? So firstly, I, I didn't approach this debunking because I don't know, you know, like it's not like I have my theories and I'm going in. I just I kind of approached it, I think, as a normal person would and thought, well, are they is this just totally crazy? Is there any truth in it? And I think most conspiracy theories have a kernel of truth at the beginning. But in my experience, what I learned is a lot of them is just 10 percent of the people got the wrong end of the stick and took something seriously that was either a joke or a sort of philosophical statement. But weird, weirdly, there were two that if I had to put money on, I think I think there probably is something in UFOs. Now, I don't think that they're little green men, you know, because, I mean, it seems to me that if these people, little green men are landing constantly, why are they just constantly abducting and probing toothless rednecks? Why are they not just landing outside the UN and saying, look, we've got something? So I'm not sure what it is they want, but there's definitely been enough footage from like respectable sources and masses amounts of people seeing weird stuff in the in the sky i'm just not sure it's the little green men et thing yeah. but there's something maybe unexplainable and then weirdly covid now covid uh supposedly started in a wet market in wuhan off a bat and i think the likelihood of the chances of that happening 600 meters away from the largest coronavirus laboratory <laughs> in China is absolutely ridiculous. And it seems to be pretty clear what happened. There was yeah. obviously some sort of accidental leak. I don't think it's beyond the realms of reason that the Chinese government then like hushed it up. And I think we would have all gone with that, except we're not on Team Trump. Well, I'm not. And Trump started calling it Kung Flu and being racist about the Chinese. And so you instantly veer back to your team because you think I can't agree with him. And so, you know, even a stop clock is right twice twice uh, a yeah. day. And, and, yeah. and I think Trump probably was right on that. Uh, but I could, you know, because I'm so tribal now as well. It's terrible. And that's what I think we have to break down. Yeah. Um, without giving anything away, because obviously I don't, when people are going to come and see the show, I want it to be completely fresh for them. But what made you want to start this conspiracy journey, you know, with the book and then the tour? And what, where did you like get the inkling to do this? Well, I mean, I, you know, this is my fifth travel book and I, I like I've been to 106 countries. I've done books in the past where I've gone to look for Bigfoot and the Yeti. I've done another one where I walked across Lebanon, done another one where I've got off on weird holidays to North Korea, Chernobyl skiing in Iran. I always like going to weird places. But this is the first book where I've tackled an actual subject, I think. And I think it's because in lockdown, like most of us, we spent way more time than we should online. And I had a friend who was in the, on a ventilator. He had very early on had very bad COVID. And, you know, for me, I don't care if you don't want to take your vaccine, don't take your vaccine. I don't I really don't care. But what I do care about is when people say this thing doesn't exist and that, that the vaccine is controlling your brain or whatever, because vulnerable people who should take it don't. And that's my issue. I was listening to a podcast with Bill Gates the other day, and Bill Gates obviously has been a massive... Bill Gates is behind everything, according to conspiracists. You know, I'm being paid by Bill Gates. I wish I knew where... Can I, I have some, please? Can I have some of yeah, that? Exactly. 
But Bill Gates was asked, you know, what, what do you think about all this? And he just said, he kind of said what I've always said, actually, which is that, you know, if Sharon from Peterborough isn't taking a vaccine or isn't doing something because she thinks that Bill Gates wants control of her mind, the truth is, Sharon, he's just not interested in what's going on in your mind. Like the arrogance of it. It's like no one cares. Uh, and I just think it's a very strange place we've got to where doctors are seen as the enemy. Uh, and I think it's very frightening. But the reason I did it was because I was arguing with all these people online. And I started to think, are these people actually believe this stuff or they're just doing it for clicks? And so I really wanted to look people in the eyes and say, so tell me, you believe in a flat earth? And I did. And they did. <laughs> I saw a brilliant. Let me try and find this. I saw a brilliant statement earlier about flat earth, actually. Um, uh, the Flat Earth Society has members all around the globe. Yeah, so that's the oldest trope. And actually, in a Fantastic. sense, in a way, I think that's a conspiracy in itself. So that supposedly comes, the Flat Earth Society did have a Facebook page, and supposedly they posted the Flat Earth Society has members all around the globe. But I actually think that's apocryphal. I don't think they did. You don't uh, think but, but yes, I've written about that in the book, and it's funny. <laughs> uh, it's, it's no more ridiculous than the concept of a flat Earth, where you think that the Earth is flat and Australians don't exist and they're holograms. So... Now, you, you've obviously been in the industry a long time. Uh, I think it's fair to say that over the last few years, comedy and what you can laugh at has changed. Um, do you agree that when it comes to comedy, everything should be on the table? Or do you think that there are certain subjects that should be avoided? Uh, I mean, my, I mean I, I, I've, always, I've always not done that sort of comedy, so... I've always been fine with it. I mean, the rule to me always is don't punch down, you know, right. punch up. So right. if you're punching up at power or stuff, then it's fine. I mean, you can, you can do whatever you want. I don't think you can't tell people what to make jokes about. You can't tell people what they find funny, but I think you need to think about it sometimes and the effects it, it has. But I mean, what is funny? Funny is subjective. Like, if, if everyone found the same thing funny, then we'd all be watching Ricky Gervais and that would be it. Um, but even Ricky Gervais, for instance, he's kind of, he's gone on a bit of a, you know, oh, look at me, I'm so anti-woke. And what does woke mean, really? I mean, woke just means don't be a tosser, really. <laughs> I don't know if I can say that. Well, I will so, now, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'm not woke, but I'm also, I'm not really interested in having a go at people that already have a hard enough time. But I don't tell jokes in that way, so it's different. So it's a very long and complicated way of saying I don't know. Uh, You're not allowed think... to not know. Just remember that. You have to sort of say yes or no. Yeah, and no, I don't know. But I, I, I'm confident, I think, that every joke I make, I can stand behind it. Yeah. You know, like I'd say, because so, I just think there are easy jokes. Yeah. Um, but I don't really tell jokes. So... I'm, that's my get out you know you, I'm, you I'm, talk about my funny show's more of a, and funny things my show's more well you know trigger happy was more surreal scenes and improv in 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 the real world and people having to deal with me dressed as an idiot you know and my show is more extreme powerpoint it is really funny because there are just really funny things out there about conspiracies and i certainly think myself and dr julian northcott is gonna be a very weird thing because <laughs> yeah i mean I, he's he's put out some promo material um that is just out there so yeah we'll see I what love, happens i love that you're going on tour with somebody you haven't met i think that's just fantastic i think it's superb it's a well, the second half of the start. show will brilliant the second half of the show will be pretty much will unscripted we'll have no idea what's going oh, on wow. so okay it'll be quite fun so it makes it fun every night um now you mentioned trigger happy tv i mean the success of that was just crazy i mean i won't say overnight because nothing is overnight but it was pretty quick uh, 60 countries around the world. What was that like? Well, it was overnight for me. It was my first, you know, I did my life the wrong way around. I had quite a serious life before. I was a diplomat in Prague and I worked in Parliament for ITN. Um, and I always wanted to be a travel writer. And I kind of, it was only because I got fired from ITN that I ended up working on a show and then started to make Trigger Happy. Um, Trigger Happy was weird because it was overnight and it was my first proper TV show. But on the other hand, I put so much work into it. Yeah. You know, we filmed for a year solid. Trigger Happy happened right at the moment where before, like two years before, I would have had to hire a whole film crew every time I wanted to go filming and they'd want lunch breaks and whatever. But Trigger Happy was a bit like punk in that you could suddenly just buy a guitar and, and do your own thing. And suddenly you could buy a camera, the first camera that was just good enough quality. I mean, look at it now, it's terrible quality. But uh, And so it meant we could just go off and film. 
And so we filmed and filmed and filmed and filmed. But all of Trigger Happy really uh, came down to the edit. And I spent I spent four months in the edit just making it totally smooth and choosing the music, which was massive for me. So I was really proud of it. But I I had no idea. I think because no one knew who, who we were, me and Sam, everyone just left us alone and we just handed it into Channel 4. And I remember them telling us it was going out on Friday night between Friends and Frasier. And I was just like... Oh my god! But I still didn't have a concept. For those that don't of... know, that was two of the biggest comedies ever at the time. Yeah, I mean, it was prime time Friday night, and I was like, I, I was excited enough to get on telly. So, yeah, it was just very weird the whole thing, and I, I don't think I realised at the time how big it was. I remember the first week that Trigger Happy went out, I was on a train, and that ringtone went off, and people didn't know I was on there. And three people stood up and went, "Hello, I'm on a train," and I was oh, like, "Oh wow!" And I just thought, "What has happened?" Like very odd. But I just I wasn't very comfortable with mass fame. It's it's a very odd place to be because the moment you get up there, everyone's trying to knock you down. Yeah. And I didn't really want to get up there in the first place. <laughs> I'm a sort I'm a sort of contrarian, but I'm incredibly proud of Trigger Happy TV. And every day I'll bump into someone that will come up and they're really sweet and they just go, You made me laugh so much, or you know, I used to watch it at school or whatever. And that that just that's such a nice thing to have. You you talk about that catchphrase. Whenever I interview a band, I always say that somebody once said uh, to me that you never record a song that you don't want to sing for the rest of your life because yeah. you never know what track when you record it is going to be that big hit that you're going to have to do for the rest of life. The one that you think is going to be the big hit and you are going to, you know, this beautiful, intricate ballad that you're going to sing for the rest of your life will probably just remain an album track and never do anything. That two minute little pop ditty that you absolutely hate and recorded it because the record company told you you had to is going to be the song you've got to sing for the rest of your life. So you never record anything you're not prepared to do for the rest of your life. I bet you had no idea that was what you would be stuck with. Yeah, it's a really smart question that, and and um, because weirdly, I think most comedians want to be musicians. I certainly did. I was in a band before. I was much more interested in music than comedy, and most musicians like comedy. Uh, and I used to think, oh my god, how amazing to be a band and go touring. But then I've you know I've toured with bands that I know now, and you just you see that they're just playing the same thing every yeah. night, but they still get a kick out of it. Trigger Happy was interesting because the big mobile was something. I, it was very different from the rest of the show. And so I always used to put it before the, the credits because it was very different. Most of Trigger Happy TV was kind of weird, sad moments of me dressed as a snail, having a nervous breakdown to beautiful music. Uh, and and but, but the big mobile was something that even if you hadn't seen Trigger, you kind of, you knew what it was. And actually, because it was the Nokia ringtone, if you didn't change your ringtone on a Nokia, it just went off. So every time it was like a subliminal ad for us. So... What I'm saying is, yes, it, it's taken me a long time. To, would I prefer to have a better better catchphrase than hello? Yes. <laughs> uh, but at least I've got something that people remember yeah. me for. But yes, but I think if people think that's all Trigger Happy was, you know, and I get people go, oh, look at you, just shout into a big mobile phone. I go, my God, I work my you know, butt off on Trigger Happy TV and we put so much into it and there were like 60 jokes in each show and the, and the, the mobile was one, but it did cut through. Uh, I do have a new one now because I did a sort of mini trigger happy in about 2016 because I had some ideas and I did a character that was a bit like Jeremy Vine, one of those angry cyclists that has GoPros everywhere. And the joke was that everywhere was a cycle lane. And basically uh, I just drove through libraries and restaurants and anywhere just going cycle lane. And I really liked it, but nothing happened. And then my kid, who was about 16 then, came to me and said, you know that like that's all over TikTok. People are sampling it, cycle lane. So cy I get shouted cycle lane at me now as well, which is quite nice. And I, I prefer cycle lane to hello. But yeah, you know what? I'm very proud of it all. It's great. You're lucky to get one thing. TikTok is a is a funny place, isn't it? A friend of mine who's a record producer, he produced a lot of Lady Gaga's, a uh, couple of Lady, Lady Gaga's albums. And... Oh, drop that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> Clang. <laughs> yeah, clung. Um, but so he, he recorded a track for her album and it, it remained an album track. You know, he had other hits with her, but this particular track remained an album track. You remember in the Wednesday TV series when Wednesday does the dance at the end, at, at, like their ball, so on TikTok, somebody changed the actual music with the track from Lady Gaga. So it was never, it, you know, that was recorded years ago. It was never intended to be anything. And all of a sudden that happened on TikTok. And, the, the well, I can tell you, it went to number one and the amount of money he's made from it is just 
beyond unbelievable. And it's just crazy that some person, probably in a bedroom somewhere or whatever, did that sub, you know, made yeah. that change. And, that's, and it worked. That's the effect it can have. But I mean, it's so, you know, the whole the whole battlefield, if you call the showbiz a battlefield, has changed. Now, like my kid, you know, I'll play him some music and say, oh, you because we've got very similar taste in music. He's got very old soul. And he'll have heard it on FIFA. Like he's heard all his music on FIFA. Um, but it's the same sort of thing that really by putting something out and just it becomes viral. I mean, I had four bands. I, I released three soundtrack albums from Trigger Happy and they all did incredibly well. Uh, and I always felt a bit of a fraud because all I'm doing is choosing the music. But I really loved the music. And I had four bands that had broken up. But because they got popular on Trigger Happy TV, they got back together and toured, which I just loved. I thought that oh, was such a... That's, I love yeah. that. That's what yeah. I'm all about. A nice bit of positivity. Something great coming from it. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Dom, thank you so much for talking to me. I've absolutely loved it. It's been a pleasure. So for those that want to go and see you again, you are at the Portsmouth New Theatre Royal on the 1st of March with your Conspiracy Tourist Tour. And I would highly urge, but I don't think there's many tickets left. I think there's literally a handful of tickets left. So go and see Dom Jolly. It's going to be an amazing show. And the best bit about it is neither Dom nor I have got any idea what's going to happen. Uh, I, I've, to be fair, I've done some work on it. I know the first half, I'm all right with that. But the second half, like, I honestly, I have no idea. Now you told me there's security, I'm very worried. I mean, I know Portsmouth's a bit tough, <laughs> but come on. You we, you may get a heckler or two. Oh, I love a heckle. That's fine. Gee, I'm, I'm all there for the heckle here. Yeah. Right, Dom, thank you very much for talking to me. I really do appreciate it.